Today's event is the first hybrid um, event. So uh, we are managing both online um, as well as face-to-face -face, um, audience. It's very nice to see you all uh, in the same space. And also um, it's very nice to welcome you um, for those um, joining us online. And I'm, I'm conscious um, Ambassador, um, His Excellency Ambassador Paul Kavana is joining us from, from Tokyo. Um, to at the moment it's 10 o'clock in the evening. So um, thank you very much for joining us. Um, ambassador Kavana, as you may know, um, was former ambassador to China as well. So it's a great honor to have you there. And I'd like to introduce um, today's keynote speaker, um, Professor Key Paramo. Um, Professor Paramo is Professor of Asian Studies in University College Cork. And born in and growing up in Australia, um, Professor Paramo studied Asian history and Asian studies at the Australian National University. During which um, Professor Paramo worked for the Australian and Department of Defence. And after graduation, Professor Paramo worked for the Australian Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade. After that, um, Professor Paramo got a um, prestigious um, scholarship from the Japanese government. So as a Monbusho scholar, um, Professor Paramo completed MA and PhD at Todai, University of Tokyo um, in intellectual history. He has numerous publications, I'm not gonna mention it, but one of them is this Japan, Japan um, Japanese um, Confucianism, um, a cultural history, uh, which was um, a choice academic title um, award winner. And you have got so many awards and um, grants and from various um, universities and institutes across the world, um, Institute of um, Chinese Literature and Philosophy, um, Academia Sinica Taipei, um, Institute of East Asian Studies at UC Berkeley, and again, many um, universities and institutions in Japan. So um, without further ado, um, I would hand over to you, um, Kiwi. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Naonori Kodate, and thank you so much uh, for this kind invitation to Dublin um, to give a, a presentation today. It was beautiful to walk around the UCD campus. Uh, it's a fantastic university, beautiful modern buildings, uh, large, uh, lots of students from all kinds of backgrounds interacting together. So it, it, it's lovely to be here. Um, this is, due to the pandemic, only my second uh, uh, address in Dublin. Uh, I gave an address at Trinity uh, a few months ago, although that was unfortunately only online. So it's very special to be here and thank you very much for the invitation. So today I'd like to start um, rather cheekily with exactly the same quote that I began my lecture uh, at Trinity with <laughs> a few months ago. And that's a quote from the President of Ireland, Michael D. Higgins. It is easier to get a good critique going on nationalism than it is on empire. But it is important because if you don't do it, you're at a disadvantage in understanding contemporary xenophobia, racism, and other attitudes. Now, at Trinity, I was talking about racism, and so I quoted, gave this quote in this sense. But to, in today's talk, I think the crux of this quote about the relationship between nationalism and empire, and as we'll be discussing today, that relationship of nations in international relations is, I think, also relevant. And this centrality of ideas of empire in imagination of nation, uh, of nation are of course particularly important on this day, the 11th of November, which has particular meanings, different meanings for those of us from different British colonial backgrounds <laughs> in terms of what it means about nation and empire. And I'll leave that there. Today in this talk, I wanna talk, I wanna take a comparative look at China and Japan's approaches to liberal internationalism and what we today call, and in the past has been called, the liberal international order. Now, some say that the liberal international order itself is a form of imperialism, or as the famous um, Wisconsin School international theorist, Carl Perini called it, ultra-imperialism. I think that's a little bit harsh, but certainly I think we would all agree um, that it's currently the dominant and perhaps the only international relations systems left. Given the hegemonic nature of the liberal international order, particularly today, but actually since the onset of the 20th century, how Japan and China are related to it is obviously of interest. And it's highly significant that today, many commentators contrast these two states on this point. 
um, saying that contemporary Japan is a model liberal state and contemporary China is illiberal somehow in an international relations context, or maybe even a threat to the international um, liberal international order. Now, I'll come back later to whether that's a fair characterization. But for now, let's just go with it, right? Let's just go with that characterization, um, just um, because it's convenient entry point, I think, for what I hope is a useful historic and contemporary comparison between the two. Because through modern history, and indeed as part of the development of the international liberal order itself, China and Japan have taken very different, but repeatedly intersecting, intersecting approaches to liberal internationalism. Historically, oh, oh that's right. Yeah, historically, um, we could argue that this diagram displays the changing nature of Chinese and Japanese intersections with the liberal international order. In a very short period of just 150 years, China and Japan have each at different times taken rapidly pro or anti um, liberal international approaches and have defined and even constructed them, their modern states in reactions to perceptions of liberal internationalism, pivoting back and forth between these extreme positions. I'm not very good with PowerPoint. I actually wanted to create a, a sort of arrows intersecting like this because you see that, that basically, um, as you see here, these two countries sort of swap positions. So in this talk, I wanna briefly chart this history looking for the reasons behind the dynamic moves we see here is a way of reflecting not just on Japan and China, but more importantly, upon the liberal international order itself. So this talk will have four sections. Um, in section one, I'll begin by reminding us of the nature of the centrality of conceptions of East Asia in early liberal thought itself, in European liberal thought, in the intellectual genealogy of liberal internationalism, before then looking at how Japanese nation state formation at the end of the 19th century interacted with that gene genealogy, where Japan was basically imagined as a modern nation in order to fit into the emerging um, international order, which was based, of course, on the unequal treaties. In section two, I'll then move on to look at the World War I. And it, so in that, in that period, of course, Japan created itself to fit into that liberal international order. In section two, I'll look at the World War I to World War II interbellum where Japan rather became an early and vociferous opponent of the new liberal international order. At the same time, of course, as China under Chiang Kai-shek was a huge supporter of the liberal international order. In section three, I'll then move on to the post-World War II period, where these roles were yet again reversed, Japan becoming a fervent supporter of the liberal international order with China outside it. And I'll conclude in section four through a focus on the period from China's sort of slow entry into the liberal international system from 1979, and then coming back to now. And hopefully that's the beginning of our discussion. So in the interest of time, because there is this time problem related to the pandemic and, and so forth, um, I'm gonna skip over section one uh, about the roots of liberal internationalism. I have a whole bunch of quotes here from, especially from J.S. Mill and de Tocqueville, and they're different quotes to the ones I use at Trinity, by the way. But basically, um, these are quotes um, from around the time, actually, of the British and French burning of the Summer Palace. And, and the, the simple takeaway points from these quotes that I don't have time to read out to you is that martial culture, violence, and particularly racialized visions of violence sat centrally in liberal doctrine. If you read J.S. Mill, who's one of the more, the more liberal liberals, <laughs> or de Tocqueville. Um, and that this then had a big effect in East Asia itself, because um, in the construction of the modern Japanese nation, and, and the best example for this, the best textual examples are writings from, from Fukusawa Yukichi, uh, the famous um, Japanese and East Asian liberal, um, where he, picking up on European liberal thought, um, constructed ideas of Japan in opposition to a despotic China where, quote, the symbolism of the sacred and the power of strength combined as one to control the people. But in Japan, where the warrior houses in the medieval um, period had claimed power, the two concepts of sacred rank and power were distinct. Um, 
and they could exist at the same time, which could not help adding a third, this is all quoted from Fukuzawa, the principle of reason, with the principle of reason added to the idea of reverence for the imperial dignity and the idea of military rule, none of the three concepts was able to predominate. And since no single concept predominated, there naturally followed the spirit of freedom in Japan. This obviously was not the same in China, said Fukuzawa. So it's important here that we have Japan's premier liberal praising not only imperial dignity, but also military rule as the key to a reasonable liberal outlook. In this manner, Fukuzawa culturalized the idea of freedom in similar ways that had been done in Europe, linking it to a particularly macho and militarist formulation of Japanese national identity. This formulation mirrored contemporaneous Northwestern European, particularly British visions that linked ideas of intellectual autonomy to cultural historical imaginations of martial culture. Again, as we see very much celebrated on this day in certain parts of the world, the 11th of November. So let us move then on to um, section two, the interbellum, which now is pretty much universally historicized um, this period of history as the failure of Woodrow Wilson's promise of an international liberal order. Wilson was seen as promising self-determination. And in the colonized world, this promise was perceived to mean decolonization, which clearly Wilson had no intention. That was not his plan at all. And the failure in respect of the Paris Peace Conference was not only a failure, of course, for the colonized, but also for certain imperial powers, the more recent imperial powers. For them, it resulted in a hierarchicalization of imperialism, where established imperial powers, France, Britain, were allowed to hold on to everything while new imperial powers were restrained. And in Japan, this was perceived as a racial hierarchicalization of empire. And that was part of the path which led to Japan eventually taking unilateral action in East Asia, leaving the League of Nations in 1931 after annexing Northeast China, and eventually, of course, lining up with the other fascist powers against the liberal orders. It was rather in China under Chiang Kai-shek and the nationalists um, where liberal internationalism was supported and where uh, Chiang Kai-shek became, and the, and the KMT became not even supporters, but supplicants, in fact, staking their very existence in the international system. And um, I mean, one point of that was the Shanghai massacre. We don't have time to talk about this, but the, the, the split in the KMT with the communists. But the main... Um, but the best example of this centrality of the liberal international order for Chiang Kai-shek was the extent of China's reliance on, and if you will, belief in liberal internationalism, when Chiang Kai-shek committed the most elite units of the Chinese army at the very beginning of full-scale war with Japan in the Battle of Shanghai. The decision to make a stand, to commit all these you know, hundreds of thousands of elite crack, highly trained, trained really well-armed Chinese army troops to throw them all into the first battle was made to make a stand in front of foreign eyes in Shanghai. And this is understood by everybody is trying to bring on nine power intervention to try and bring on international uh, uh, pressure to restrain Japan. Chiang sacrificed the creme de la creme of his military power and half of his most loyal and useful supporters, the Huangpu officer class, half of who were killed in the Battle of Shanghai. Now, the failure of this, not the failure of winning the battle because they knew they weren't going to win the battle, but the failure of getting international support through fighting so hard for many, many, many months of street to street fighting. Um, the failure of this was, of course, the beginning of the end of Chiang Kai-shek's rule in China. The, the, but it was also, it showed on a positive note, the degree of faith and commitment he had to the liberal international. He had sacrificed what was personally his trump card in Chinese domestic as much as in international politics, the modern army, a modern army personally loyal to him on the hope of mobilizing the liberal international system. And this, this event is all part of, you know, what in, in post-World War II period was you know, in America was this big thing of how we lost China, how we the Americans lost China. And interestingly, this sort of IR theory of liberal internationalism, of interventionism actually was born out of reflections on the mistake we'd made by not backing up Chiang Kai-shek. Um, so then, let's then move on to the third section, 
which I forgot to put a, uh, a title thing for, but section number three, if you can imagine, there's a, a slide there, post-World War II. Now, the end of World War II obviously transformed both countries. And the Japanese example is clean, crisp, and clear. Evil fascism seamlessly transforms, seamlessly transforms to model liberal democracy. But, you know, it's true. Uh, the Japanese transformation was and is indeed incredible. Japan has had continuous democratic institutions, not like France changing institutions all the time, the same democratic institutions in place since 1947 and has preserved a pacifist international policy and practice throughout this time, something achieved by no other major nation or state in the history of humanity. The fact that Japan had long, deep liberal and leftist political traditions was crucial here. Um, uh, the success of liberal dem democratic politics, people often mention the sort of the Korean War and various things happening around Japan, but I think we also have to focus on how liberal democratic politics did integrate, for instance, it, it integrated democratic socialists and left liberals to an extent into the governing order. There was toleration, institutionalized toleration of political dissent. And an example of that is, is really the worst moment in post-war Japanese history for democracy in 1960. Um, and the, the, the protests um, uh, led by the Socialist Party and the Labor Movement against the renewal of the security agreement with the United States um, in 1960. These demonstrations, although led by the Socialist Party, which is a bit like the Labor Party, you know, it was a Social Democratic Party, um, was supported by left thinkers like Mariama Masao, uh, who you see here, uh, who addressed massive crowds calling for the US-Japan security agreement not to be ratified. In hindsight, this conflict was the closest Japanese democracy had to collapsing, but it didn't. Um, and a lot of that was to do with these, this deep intellectual imprint um, that you see in Mariama Masao, uh, in, in um, Tsurumi Shinsuke, and a lot of liberal thinkers at that time. This very broad intellectual base, which they are sort of figureheads of, but which shared Marxist, classical, liberal, and conservative elements, and at times reached from the left wing of the Socialist Party through the liberal educated elite to certain factions within the LDP. A lot of the factions of the LDP in this crisis uh, were not prepared to, for instance, see the, the military use, were not prepared, were not happy when Socialist Party deputies were ejected from the parliament and took action to, to get rid of the. The, the LDP prime minister and replace him with someone more moderate. So this is an interesting sort of example uh, of, of Japanese liberal democracy. Um, I've got a whole bunch of videos here, but again, because of time, unfortunately, we can't show these, but maybe some other time. Um, in China, of course, victory of the CCP in the civil war and the declaration of the People's Republic in 1949 simply removed China from the liberal international order in the post-World War II period. But also represented the first time a modern Chinese government had established actual sovereignty over the country. Now, the global significance of the establishment of the PRC was not only the fact that sovereignty had been delivered through a communist revolution, but through a communist revolution that for the first time overtly expressed an ideology of peasant agrarian-based led revolution. And this is very important for the rest of the colonized world, of course, and this is the 1950s, 60s, the age of decolonization. And most of these decolonizing countries are also, of course, have an agrarian base because that was the nature of European imperialism, right? Was as, as in Ireland, right? Is to hold down industrial, stop industrial development within the colonized area and just extract primary resources. This was the class, this was classic um, imperial exploitation, right? Um, so, so they were all in an agrarian state. Lack of US recognition for the PRC, together with the lack uh, of engagement with, uh, from America with figures like Ho Chi Minh in Vietnam and Lumumba in the Congo, who expressly reached out to the United States, uh, but were rebuffed. Um, this basically pushed, you know, drove decolonizing states away from the liberal international order. So at the end of World War II in colonized Asia and Africa, to an extent, there was a sort of continuation of the system before World War II, where you sort of have two internationals. You have the liberal international order, which is a closed, completely closed door. They're not going to offer you anything in terms of decolonization. And then you've got the, the communist international. Now the old USSR based communist international had shut, had shut, had joined the UN, but you had this sort of new sort of like communist international um, uh, related to China. 
So there is this continuity. But there was a big difference in the post-World War II period. As well as this rupture, there was a convergence which began to emerge in the way different states in Asia, in Asia particularly, were governed. The post-World War II period in Asia, as well as being one of the hot spots in the world for military confrontation between um, capitalism and communism, was a place and period of convergence between liberal and illiberal political and economic systems. What do I mean by that? If you look at the US satellite states uh, created to fight against communism, they were very unlike the pre-World War II colonies. Um, they weren't just set up for resource extraction, but rather became developmental states. The states or quasi-states lined up against the communists, Taiwan, South Korea, South Vietnam, to name just three. Despite, sure, you know, being politically subservient to an extent to the form of uh, imperial powers and um, often being headed by military strongmen who had, who had served in the colonial armies like Park Jong-hee. Um, on the other hand, increasingly practiced a very, very different form of gov political economy, what we now refer to as the Asian development model. Strong state-led support and direction of capitalist projects supporting industrial development. And this developmental approach, uh, not, not allowing yourself to be pushed back into primary products, but developing industry, um, this did um, of course, lay the groundwork for real welfare and real autonomy uh, in these uh, satellite states. So why, why this difference in the way that these states were governed? Um, the historian Prasenjit Duara has demonstrated that the roots of this model and the roots of, of American support for this model of development within these satellite states as well, lay in the Japanese imperialism of the 1930s and 40s, particularly in Manchuria, where Japan had experimented with a different kind of imperialism, an imperialism which employed, employed local nationalisms instead of subjugating them, which developed and educated the populations and an economy towards an industrial production, industrial production in the service of the empire, but an industrial economy, rather than trying to hold them back in an agrarian state. The early Asian developmental states, the so-called tigers, were in a sense the gifted mutant children of Japan's scientist experiments in industrial uh, colonialism of what, what, what Japan had done, particularly in Manchuria and to a lesser extent in other colonies, and which was picked up by the Americans. So despite these countries being under the US liberal world order umbrella, in actual fact, much of their political economy model was inherited from pre-World War II Japanese empire. And this can be seen, therefore, as a form of convergence between liberal and illiberal world orders in Asia. The manner through which the Cold War began to end in Asia is also indicative of this convergence. And this is where China re-enters the picture. Um, and of course, in relation to the Asia developmental model. So now I move on to section four, the last section of the talk, which is what we've done from sort of the end of World War II. And this is from 1979 until now. The Cold War ended early in Asia. Right. In East Asia, it was the late 1970s, the 1979 US Chinese detente, a good decade before the breaking down of the Berlin Wall that began to end the Cold War. This detente, of course, came together with the beginnings of Deng Xiaoping's um, economic reforms, keeping state control, but opening up to capital, a creation of a system which would also be referred to as Asian developmentalism because it was so clearly related to the Japanese model. This new international position of China was symbolically marked domestically by Deng Xiaoping's four modernizations, but internationally, it was marked by the 1979 Chinese invasion of Vietnam, which Deng Xiaoping telegraphed two days earlier, said to, um, said to Kissinger, uh, basically told him he was going to invade Vietnam by saying, um, Xiao Peng Yo Bu Ting Hua, Gai Da Da Pi the little boy is not listening to what he's told. He needs his bottom spanked. And the little boy is, of course, Vietnam, right? So um, this is in interesting also, this, this violence, <laughs> the, the violent act in, re in, in, in rejoining the, the, the liberal uh, 
group. So from the end of the 1970s and this change, in economic and trade terms, China became in some ways like other US satellite states in East and Southeast Asia. Or as the head of um, the National University of Singapore's Asia Centre put it in 2011, and by this time that was Prasenji Duara, the same scholar, quote, the centrality of capitalism and nationalism in China affiliates it with the victorious capitalist side in the Cold War, in which it has become a key player today, albeit with its own developmental path. Rather than victory or defeat, I wonder if convergence isn't the more useful way to look at this. The Asian developmental model, central state involvement therein, was first comprehensively explained by Chalmers Johnson, of course, whose approach at the time was seen as radical because he admitted the utility of the fascist pre-war period um, economic processes in the state-led model that Mitty used to lead the economic resurgence of post-war democratic Japan. He linked the sort of evil past with the beautiful present. And this in itself, of course, was a convergence of a very illiberal Japanese politi political economy over the pre-war period with a markedly liberal democratic post-war international relations setup. After all, it was the economic strength provided by what we now call Asian developmentalism, which allowed Japan the political stability and strength to hold their line, both against extreme left and extreme right challenges in the latter 20th century, which they often faced at the same time, that 1960 event being one example. China's interaction with the liberal international order can perhaps be seen as a similar form of convergence. And maybe this is a way for us to think through the significant challenges that are now faced in relations with China. The previous sort of pre-Trump, pre-Xi Jinping, right? This, this, this understanding of China's engagement with the liberal international order that you know, we used to have until 10 years ago or five years ago was, was that China is increasingly conforming to the Western system and that as China becomes richer, it had become more democratic and so forth. In a sense, that neoliberal US reading was very similar to Duara's leftist US reading in that it saw liberal capitalism arrayed against state-centered socialism and then one side winning or one side losing. But actually, was what was what or is what we perceive as the liberal international in, in order, order in Asia? is what we perceive or was what we perceived as the liberal international order in Asia, even its liberal democratic linchpin, Japan, was it really only a liberal Western copycat? Of course it wasn't. And of course it isn't. In fact, as touched on earlier, Japan has far outstripped any Western country in some of the moral ideals that its liberal internationalism embodies. Pacifism. Most IR theories and most commentators and politicians in the West will say that economic power must be accompanied by military power, that the exercise of strategic power requires military power to match economic power. As we discussed at the beginning, liberalism itself contains the seeds of this fetishization of military power and martial culture, as we see in those early texts. But Japan has not in any way even remotely used its military power to deal with any strategic challenges for three quarters of a century. This is a completely new way of being a nation, made in Japan. But unlike Toyotas or Nissans or Sushi or Anime, the West is not keen to consume this Japanese product. Western IR theorists simply ignore this, just as Western global historians and economists talk about the miracle of the rise of China as something as if it's new as if this hasn't all happened before, as if Japan in the 1970s and 80s never existed. We are told by the same people that tell us China is in a liberal state that, it's, that as it economically develops, it will ineluctably move to military power as that is what happens, always happens in history. J.S. Mill, John Stuart Mill, de Tocqueville and Fukuzawa Yukichi, our old liberals, they would have a message for these people. They would say, 
your way of thinking is backward Confucian way of seeing the world. <laughs> they would say those who only look to the past when predicting the future are people who, and I quote directly from Fukuzawa Yukichi, who possess no views of their own and no mind of their own, who are Confucians in this critical sense, who are not open to innovation, who are not open to newness and change. I would conclude with a wonderful quote from the great post-war Japanese liberal thinker, Mariama Masao, who I mentioned earlier, and of course, probably the most famous professor of our, um, of Professor Kodate and Mayan's old school, the University of Tokyo. We've got a little, little gakubatsu happening here <laughs> in a very restrained way. Um, this is a great quote from him. And it's commonly referred to as the democracy as permanent revolution quote, um, where Mariama linked the, the Marxist idea of permanent revolution to the preservation of democracy in Japan. およそ民主主義を完全に体現したようなせいどというものは、かつても将来も、ないのであって、人はたかだかより多い、あるいはより少ない民主主義を語る量にすぎない。その意味で永久革命とはまさに民主主義にこそふさわしい明示である。a system perfectly realizing democracy has not existed in the past and will not ever exist in the future. People will not go beyond debating more democracy, less democracy. In this sense, permanent revolution is a term particularly appropriate to democracy, end quote. Perhaps the same could be said of liberalism and liberal internationalism. Thank you very much for your time. Thanks so much, Francis and Ramo. And um, time for questions. I'm sure we have lots of questions. Maybe for the audience um, attending this session online as well, if you can use QA um, function there and send them questions. Anybody in the audience? Or comments, of course. Yes. Arguments. Any reactions. It's all about liberal democracy, so feel free to. Uh, yeah. Can I? Yeah. Um, thank you very much. This is a really interesting talk. Um, the topic at the end was like a distinct version of you know, liberal democracy in Japan and capitalism. But to what extent is that um, endemic in Japan's uh, psyche, or to what extent is it a, a reaction to the kind of scarring of the second government to the great? How towards Thanks very much. So I guess the, the first part of the question is what are the origins of Japanese pacifism, <laughs> sort of philosophically almost even? And then the, the second part is, you know, is, is it endurable? Um, and uh, firstly, we should define pacifism, of course, uh, you know, because there's an argument within Japan itself, of course, um, by pacifism, pacifism, I mean pacifism in practice by Japan. So that does not mean not having an army. Of course, Japan has very, very significant and very, very modern, formidable military forces. It's, it's choosing not to use those military forces or the threat of those military forces in the way that you conduct yourself um, in terms of your strategies around the world. Um, and that has been the case for the last 75 years. Um, uh, as far as what is the origins of that, I think it's so complex that given that there's time issues, I won't go into it, but I, I, I would be happy, especially if I was having a pint rather than standing before you in this, in this hierarchicalized setting, I'd be very happy to talk about all kinds of things, you know, from Buddhism to various other things. But of course, the World War II experience is, is, is very much uh, part of that. Um, in terms of how will, will uh, the, the Japanese approach uh, to non-use of the military or what I call pacifism continue? It's been threatened many times. So Abe wasn't the first person. It was Kishida in 1960 also wanted to, he didn't just want to uh, renew that agreement. He also wanted to change the Japanese constitution to allow the army to be used aggressively. Um, so um, it's been challenged continuously, but it's continued to hold. And I think the reason why it holds is because it works. Uh, there's a great video. Uh, I don't think we have time to show the video, but there's a great video from um, Tsurumi, um, Tsurumi Shinsuke, another great University of Tokyo liberal, and it's from the 1960 period, and he's he's giving an interview, and he's saying, um, "Why do we not want to? Why do we not want to extend the 
the security agreement because it's not it's simple it's not in our interests it's dangerous for us it's like why do you want to have a, a it, it, you can get bombed you can get nuclear why would you do it so if it works for you as long as it keeps working it seems to still work pretty well that, that, that i guess will be my rather simplistic answer yeah. thank you um so some questions are coming through online i and i also if you have questions um from the floor i will repeat um the questions so that the audience online can hear um get the questions so the first question from an anonymous person after world war ii was was japan forbidden to have a military while they could have a domestic police force if so was this policy changed yeah that's sort of just related to the, the previous conversation you know some people interpret the japanese constitution of course as meaning that, that japan should not have military forces but the supreme court of japan has ruled that that is not the meaning of the japanese constitution and that the japanese state may maintain military forces for the express purposes of self-defense and therefore even things like what kinds of weapon systems are purchased and stuff uh, are considered uh, uh, those decisions are made within the parameters of the supreme court of Japan's ruling on the constitution. So that's the current state and has been the state um, since the 1950s in relation to uh, Japanese military force. Japan does have military force, but, um, but has not, does not, and seems to have no intention of using those military forces as part of its, of advancing its strategy in the world. Thank you very much. There's another question. Um, so from uh, Mark. Um, thank you so much for a fascinating talk. Since Jimmy Carter was there in your last image, how do you see the issue of human rights folding into this scenario, or does it? Good question. This is the trouble with online, right? I'd love to engage with uh, Mark and 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 ask, uh, can you be more specific? What are you What are you thinking of specifically here? Um, yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, I, we need we did more concrete examples, I guess, to to see. And because my speech covered different periods, uh, it's I'm not sure exactly which period. Is this from him? No, it's from somebody else. Right? Uh, yes, there's some other question. Um, so, Mark, if you can specify um, a little bit um, your question. And in the meantime, there's another one coming through. Um, from Dr. Paul Linehan. Um, could you provide your assessment of both Japan and China using their respective coast guards in gray area operations to avoid levels of military operations? Uh, yeah, I can actually take this because yeah. I can see the questions. So yeah. I, can, I can take them if you like. Yeah, um, yeah uh, in terms of the Coast Guards, I'd refer you to a book by my, I was at Leiden University for 15 years, for 15 years before I came to Cork and there's a great scholar there called Lindsay Black, who's written a great book about the Japanese Coast Guard and um, the use of the Japanese Coast Guard for various roles. So I'd refer you to that book as far as the Coast Guard question goes. Um, and then should I just take them as they go? Is that all right? Given the history of Japan and China, do you think if China invades Taiwan, what do you think of the reaction of the Japanese government might be? Hmm. These questions are not really academic. They're more like they should be addressed to professional diplomats. I think I was I, I was in DFAT a long time ago, but that's so long ago. <laughs> Actually, at that time, there was, there was uh, Chen Shui-bian was president of Taiwan, and it was another period where there was really, really full on tension uh, between uh, China and um, between China and Taiwan. And uh, I mean, at least at that time. I don't think it's any secret that there were plans to defend Taiwan. I mean, I think the Americans have been quite open about that uh, recently, right? And and I think there are even plans, even without America, to defend Taiwan. I think uh, I think countries like Australia and Singapore, um, certainly ten years ago, they were 10, 20 years ago, they would have had the capacity on their own to defend Taiwan. So um, yeah, that's all I could say about that at the moment. Uh, yeah. Um, no, would be the, you want me to answer this question? Uh, yeah. Sorry, let's see if it, yeah. yeah are these from there? John, um, or maybe, okay. Okay, quite long. It's, it's interesting, a lot of the questions are about the Japanese military, right? And, 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 and pacifism. So uh, we can actually take a lot of these questions together because a lot of them are asking, um, you know, in relation to the changing dynamics in East Asia, uh, is Japan being forced into remilitarization? Um, 
uh, and then another question from Ilana May Patterson. Um, is it possible for a country to be pacifist without maintaining um, a military, a strong military? Uh, these are all interesting questions. Uh, I don't have like direct answers to any of these questions. All I can refer to is the facts. And the facts is Japan is, has not used its military for strategic purposes for longer than, than any state of that size has ever done in history. Um, and during that period, they have maintained a very strong military, which they continue to maintain. Um, there is a lot of pressure at the moment um, on the military budget of Japan. There's a, it, it, it's a question that's really interesting. The last in the election that just finished, the Japanese election that just finished, a lot of the analysis of that election talked about how um, the LDP deliberately, one of their very smart things they did is they didn't allow any conversation from any of their politicians about the military budget. Uh, because they want to leave that to after the election. <laughs> because, of course, all the other countries in the region, even little countries like Australia, uh, 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 are increasing their military budgets and increasing their militaries. And so it's, there is a sort of um, arms build-up. And the normal, the normal way for Japan to respond is to continue to grow its military in a corresponding way. However, you know, in, the, in, the, in, in previous periods, that was possible just through sheer economic growth, right? You could keep the percentage of GDP expenditure the same and continue to expand, expand your military, whereas that will become problematic. So if Japan wishes to continue to expand its military at the same rate as the surrounding countries, then it would require to um, increase the percentage of the budget that would be used, and that will become um, a politically uh, sensitive issue. So yeah, that is a that's that's not the past; that's the future. That's the, that's going to become a, a political issue. It's predicted that this will become a major political issue uh, in Japan in the coming, maybe even in the coming year. Uh, yeah, so that's we can talk about that a year from now and see what happens. Any other questions for you? Um, oh, Nagasaki. Yeah. In Nagasaki, Japan has a peace park with a huge Buddha. This is a question from anonymous attendee. In, Na in Nagasaki, Japan has a peace park with a huge Buddha peace statue. Did the dropping of the atomic bombs on Nagasaki and Hiroshima give the Japanese an aversion to war with concerns that more atomic bombs could be dropped somewhere in the world? Well, yes, definitely. Um, and not just, uh, not just um, Hiroshima and Nagasaki, but the area of uh, Tokyo that I always lived in, Toshimaku. If you see pictures of Toshimaku after the great uh, firebombing of Tokyo, uh, it looks much worse than Hiroshima. There's literally nothing. This is the, the densest part of Tokyo, the densest populated part of Tokyo, literally desert, you know, literally desert. You know, hundred, well, what, 100,000 people killed within three hours, you know? So um, there's no doubt that, um, that the experiences were amazing. But it's more about how those experiences were used in the post-war. And this comes back to my earlier point about the, the intellectual depth of politics and political institutions in Japan and institutions like the University of Tokyo and their involvement with politics in various ways, the ways that the political system in Japan since uh, 1947 this sort of big tent uh, politics. So for instance, when the LDP did dominate for a very long period, sort of unchallenged, the Socialist Party was still sort of allowed to make contributions into policy. There was a sort of, there was sort of openness and this very strong uh, liberal tradition um, facilitated uh, this, type of, um, this type of conversation. And for that reason, post-war Japan and I mean, I think anybody, I don't think I'm particularly uh, qualified to talk about this. I think now or anybody else could talk about this maybe better. But post-war Japan is the way that violence was historicized. Many countries have been through terrible war experiences. Think of China. Think what happened to China during World War II or during, and during the Civil War. Think what happened to Vietnam. You know, I mean, these countries were even worse, you know, bombed even worse than Japan was, right? Experienced even, even worse destruction than atomic bombing. You know, what happened in places like Hanoi was worse than atomic bombing in some ways, right? Um, and yet it didn't happen that, the, that then after that, the polity moved towards this pacifist position. So I don't think, so to answer the question, I don't think it's about, it's, it's not just about the violence of what happened. It's about how the polity how the polity reacts to that violence, what um, instruments, what intellectual, spiritual, religious um, uh, instruments and, um, and tools it has at, at its disposal um, to, 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 to process that 
How is that violence processed? And one of the ways that the violence of World War II was processed in Japan was through an, an ideal, was through the birth of an ideal, a pacifist ideal of not wanting to be um, involved in that violence again. Uh, other countries who've had similarly violent war experiences haven't done that, but that was what, for, for, for I'm sure, a whole complex range of interacting reasons, both in deep culture and in and what was happening right at the time, that's what happened in Japan. Um, um, can I ask you one question? Um, I think you mentioned the recent election in, mm -hmm. in Japan, and what struck me um, from your um, talk today is this change and continuity. Mm -hmm. And one thing that also um, is very remarkable about Japanese political system is the stability. Like LDP is governing the country for almost, almost like since 1955, forever, and with the exception of a few years. And do you think, is there anything in that East Asian countries, um, including China, although Japan has this liberal democracy in its political system embedded, and China probably doesn't have it, but do you see any similarities around sort of movement towards more sort of a tendency towards stability and no change, continuity rather than change, or do you see changes or changes happening in East Asian countries? Yeah, this is this is a really tricky question because you know philosophically it goes back to all these questions about you know um, these Orientalist tropes actually about oh you know Oriental societies don't change you know and this is related back to these 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 nineteenth century ways of seeing the Mughal Empire and and the Qing Empire as oh they've never changed for thousands of years actually I've got a quote from uh, from J S Muir from On Liberty <laughs> in there which sort of says this thing and you see that a lot of you know some of our teachers at the University of Tokyo these great liberal liberal intellectuals they're great intellectuals but sometimes they fall into that. Like say Mariama Masao. Okay, seeing I've sort of idolized him for the whole talk, let me criticize him a bit, right? That's Mariama Masao's problem. He really falls into that, that sort of Orientalist trap. Uh, and so therefore um, he would often describe problems in Japanese uh, politics as um, a lack of capacity to change, or the Japanese culture doesn't allow change, things like this. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm a little bit hesitant to, um, to accept that. And it, you know, there's that very popular, um, uh, thing that people always say about China, you know, this, this, this sort of Chinese saying that um, in America that, that, that the parties always change, the government parties always change, but the policy never changes. Whereas in China, the government party never changes, but the policies are constantly changing. You know, this this kind the, 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 this 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 common saying, um, I think, is not an answer to this question, but it's all I've got for now. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much because I think always um, Japan has been treated as kind of exceptional exceptionalism kind of a context. You know, in when when Japan political system has been compared with European, um, especially party systems. And I was just focusing on that elect election, but um, that's, that's fascinating. I didn't want to put Japan in the same sort of Asian stereotype orientalism, but I think that's often the, in the discourse. And that's what, what normally face the kind of questions um, in the classes as well. Okay, so um, I mean, I, I hope you, um, you enjoyed the fascinating talk and please join me in a round of applause for today's speaker.